and um, they all aged out, which is fantastic. Um, it's wonderful that we have great vets and keepers um, who can give forever homes to animals. So that's what happened with the herd that we had here. And um, now we're moving into other space. So, okay, in 2016, we um, had this wonderful um, experience happen where President Obama signed the act that um, the bison became our national mammal. So the bison joined the ranks with, with what other California animal as a national symbol? The eagle. The right, you're gonna be um, hearing more about the eagle later. And who can tell us what our um, national flower is? National. National. The national mammal. So the rose. The rose is our national flower. So not our state stuff, but our national stuff. And how about the tree? What's our national tree? I was surprised. I didn't know the tree. Cherry oak. Ooh, cherries are a guest. Oak. Oh, oak is it. It represents national. Yeah, so that's just fun stuff to know. So as we go through and we're learning more and more about the bison, we're going to try a little bit to um, connect all of us to the cultural, the economic, and the ecological heritage and parts of bison and what they represent for our nation. Right, so bison or buffalo? This was the question I would get all the time um, when we were, <coughs> excuse me, interpreting about our um, bison. Do I say bison or do I say buffalo? What do you guys say? Bison. bison. You're all science bison. nerds like me. So <laughs> it doesn't matter actually. Buffalo is usually a bit more casual, and most of the time when people are talking about buffalo, they are talking about the American bison. We happen to speak a little more scientific here because you guys go through tons of training, so you are more accustomed to using bison. It's okay to use them interchangeably. Don't give our um, all of our guests a really hard time if they happen to say buffalo. It's totally okay. You can use them both. But just know when you're saying bison, just you're being a little more scientific, which is great. Okay. So we have two types of bison in um, the United States. We have um, woods bison and plains bison, and so if you look at them, you can they look very different. very different. So you're looking at two male bison right here, and um, you can definitely see a big difference in this humongous hump and all of this long shaggy hair in the front versus this nice straight line, a little more fluff here. And sometimes you can really tell the difference um, in what they call the cape, or all this hair that's covering their shoulders. So for a wood bison, a wood bison is actually the largest land mammal, okay? Plains is a bit smaller, a little more shorter, a little bit lighter. And um, the plains bison, has a more um, of a defined cape. So you're not gonna have to ID them out in the zoo. We're gonna have plains bison, but it's just something to know. <laughs> something to have in your back pocket. All right. uh, let's talk a little bit about physiology. This picture, what do you see in this picture? Love. <laughs> <laughs> That's not physiology. Just saying. Valentine's Day residual. All right. <laughs> looking through it with um, scientific eyes. <laughs> Absolutely. This is a male and this is a female. So what you can really tell is size difference and those secondary sexual characteristics, right? That male looks like a male. He's got a big old head. It's wide. And the female looks much more petite. So let's look at some of their numbers. <laughs> All right, so males are a bit bigger. They're probably 800 pounds bigger, okay? Uh, about 2,000 pounds when you get your males full size. Your females maybe about 1,200. Probably a little smaller than that. That's probably the biggest um, female max size. Um, so males, about six feet at the shoulder, okay? And females around four feet. So a considerable difference, a couple feet. Um, they both have horns. Both males and females have horns. One of the things I find really cool about bison is how fast and agile they are. 
even though they're so large. So they're both reaching 35 or more miles per hour, and they can cut corners like you wouldn't believe. So as you guys are doing a little more bison research, and you're looking up some of those YouTube videos, you're gonna find some of somebody trying to hide behind a tree with the bison on the other side. Sometimes they might get away, but sometimes the bison gets them. So they can definitely catch them with these magnificent horns because they're so quick and so agile they can cut corners like you wouldn't believe. They can also jump five feet in the air and they can swim. Wow, I think that's pretty great. Um, also, we have a little bit of a difference between males and females when it comes to um, herd behavior. Uh, the males are actually going to <clears throat> leave the herd most of the time, spend a lot of time as a solitary male. Um, definitely during breeding season, he's going to compete for rights, and then he'll be closer in with the herd. Um, but usually, it's kind of matriarchal led. Yeah, you know, it's great to know those things. Are you talking a little bit about this? Or both? Oh, you you? Go ahead. Okay. So diet, <laughs> they are herbivorous. And as I was reading about them, I kept reading grasses and sedges are something that they eat most of all. And I'm like, everybody's gonna ask me what a sedge is. So I gave you a picture right here. Basically all of these types of grasses, most of them with little seeds or flowers at the top, right? Um, when, let's see. I'm going to tell you about this. Oh, when grasses and sedges maybe aren't so much in season or not available, they're also going to be feeding on browse. It, browse. So browse is right, little tiny twigs and leaves on woody plants. So they are going to sometimes munch that, but that doesn't make up the majority of their diet unless the other things aren't available. Um, males, we found out, are a bit more of generalists. Um, so kind of going around a bit more. Females want some want really rich, if they can, high nutritious um, grasses. And that makes sense, right? If they are, you know, they have to be nursing or they're um, pregnant at the time, they want as much um, nutrition as they can. Yeah, makes sense. And knowing these, these different behaviors in terms of diet is important um, to know, in particular at the zoo, when you are the one deciding their diet, um, essentially. And, the higher diversity, both in plant composition that the males eat, as well as plant number, is, is an important thing to know. And that creates a higher ingestion and a lower um, quality of food, which is interesting, especially because females need a little higher quality to be able to produce that milk. And they move around a little bit less than the males do in their wanderings. No, great, thank you. Also, um, just one of those buzz numbers that um, you're welcome to use. They were, are going to typically forage 9 to 11 hours out of the day. So not all day, but... Forage. <laughs> so, speaking of foraging, um, even in snow, bison um, still have to get to those grasses and things like that. So, they are built differently than cattle. That wonderful hump actually allows for muscles to attach up there, and so they can swing that humongous head, and they use it as a snow plow, so they can reach the grasses under the snow, and they're making it available for all those animals who can't do this. So munching, 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 and then you're gonna see him swing his head and clear the snow from the snow plow. Oh, leave it for, for, yeah. There he goes. So that's the back and the forth, back and the forth. Okay. Um, we also, um, we're gonna talk about some other behaviors that they have. We're not gonna show you a video because we wanna explain some other things, but when you receive the information, there will be links so that you can look it up and you can see it yourself. That's that snow cloud. All right. Okay, other things um, that, are you gonna talk about it in ecology? Or should I yeah. just mention it now? Yeah, I'll talk about it. Okay. All right, let's see. There we go. Why don't we just watch videos all day? Let's see about this. Try it out. Try it out. So, as you know, um, bison have a kind of general description. These are the things that you're going to go over 
when answering easy questions that the public gives you. Following, we're going to go a little bit more and more in depth in terms of where they come from, what their relevance is, both culturally and ecologically. Um, here is a pretty rare and cool di um, map of the historical bison range. The brown is pre-colonization, so 19, early 19, sorry, early 1500s. I always say 19. The blue is the post 1870, 80 range. Um, it's been reduced drastically um, by the practices that we're going to talk about in this next slide. So here, before we get into what this actually is saying, I want to mention some general things. This big triangle and this little triangle represent total bison numbers, going all the way from <coughs> 30 to 70 million. That's spec you know speculation; we can't quite measure in. Um, the early 1500s, that's a million Great Plains bison, all the way down to post-1880 to 325 bison. All right, that's the general picture. How did we get there? So, you know, the big ships came from the east, and they colonized in the west, and the cities, and your whole middle school history class, which I'm not going to give you, but with Western expansion um, began bison impacts, right? The first and the, the maybe the, the most um, general that started in the, in, the in the 1500s and 1600s was bison disease. People brought cattle, cattle uh, started proliferating on their own, expanded a little bit, disease was transmitted. Now, coming to the 1700s and 1800s, Native American populations started interacting more with colonist populations. They started buying guns, they started having um, more horses, and both the Native Americans, partly because that was their cultural heritage, and they were used to hunting and using bison, and then the Western expanding um, set settlers started killing bison at higher rates because of the technology that was available. Now, the 1850s, a big railroad road was made from north to south. It cut across the whole country and it split the Great Plains herd into two, the north and the south herd. Um, so by the 1860s, with this railroad, there was a lot more ability to be able to kill and effectively transport and use these bison in, um, in great numbers. 1870, 15 million, 1870s, 15 million bison were killed, about 5,000 bison a day. Um, in a second, we're going to go over a little bit of the specifics of what, what that um, looks like. And very quickly, by 1886, there were approximately 325 bison left, and most of them being in the um, current Yellowstone National Park. Um, so, South Herd was eliminated, North Herd was eliminated. 1900, the change of the century, President Roosevelt in 1908 instituted the first effective reservation law protecting bison. All right, that's starting to see the slow increase of bison that we have until this day where we have 380,000 bison in total private, public ranges, Canada, United States, 320,000 bison in North America, all right? We're going to talk more about that later. Bison hunting, first and foremost, needs to be understood as a cultural um, war. It was not originally, by the colonists, seen as a means of food acquisition or commerce. It was originally seen as the base around which a lot of the Native American populations that they were trying to um, supplant and their lifestyle and their food source, right? So the, way, the reason they killed these was partly to start supplanting and, um, and changing the, the, the whole basis of a, of a culture, right? And, and that's an important thing. This right here is um, 1988, uh, painting by Albert Bierstadt, uh I think he was a German kind of anthropologist that came and he drew this painting 
um, represented is called the last of the buffalo, a very uh, emotional, cultural expression of what was happening. Right here are the Big 50 sharp rifle. That's what almost all the bison were killed with. Can I, um, I just want to add one little thing. So <clears throat> around here, we're talking about the huge decline. The huge decline was definitely initiated by the US Army to clear the way so the colonists could come in and have space. So clearing the land of bison and clearing the land of native people. And then it's quite ironic that around here, as we talk about what happened here, the US Army then realized, oh, we actually killed all of them. Now we need to protect them. So they initiated the killing and then initiated the conservation. Yeah, in different states in the 70s and 80s, there was an attempt by certain legislation, certain uh, groups to institute protection. For example, in Kansas, they said, if you kill a bison, you must, by law, use all of its flesh. Nobody paid attention to those. And so the 19, early 1900s was the first effect. All right. Um, bison hunting for commerce. Obviously, it was not just a cultural war. It became kind of redundant after a while. This is an example of thousands of bison skulls ready for shipment. And here are some numbers. Okay, what did they use the bison for? They used the bones, refining sugar, fine bone china, fertilizers, $8 a ton. Okay, $8 a ton, you could buy a ton of bison. That equals 100 skeletons. All right, that's $8 for 100 skeletons. Two and a half million dollars. Into, the can into Kansas alone, one state in 18, uh, between you know, the, the three years up here, 31 million skeletons. That's 2.5 million dollars, 31 million skeletons. Um, hides were used, they were sold for about $1.50, and only one firm that dealt in Buffalo um, sold 250,000 hides in a year. Um, meat was used, of course, uh, it helped the construction of this railroad crew. Uh, they didn't need to take that much food with them because they just ate bison. Uh, 5,000 were killed each day with the construction of the railroad, and 750,000 hides were um, moved in 1870. Uh, Orlando Brown uh, is an excellent example of recreational bison killing. Um, he killed, how many was it? 5,855 bison in two months. That's 97 bison a day. In 1876. 19 is his favorite. 19 is his favorite number. It's either 17 or 97 a day, right? You know that number pretty well. You know that number pretty well. And that's by one person. All right. Moving on. Okay. Um, so this is just another, right? representation of the quantity of bison they were moving. Um, like Johnny was saying, in Kansas, they tried to institute um, a law that was saying, if you hunt a bison and you remove that hide, you also have to use the meat. You cannot just let it sit here and rot. That was not accepted. They would not pass that law. So then Colorado tried to institute the same law. Um, that one, I think that one too was denied. Yeah, it was not, it was not enforced. And then so it was later, right, that they realized that we have to do something about this. By the time the law was instated though, they didn't have enough money for law enforcement to enforce that, right? So between the individuals that were doing it for sport, doing it for monetary value, also um, people that were riding the railroad, they could pay to shoot the bison from the railroad. So they were just like piling it up. There's so that's why people were trying to institute like use the meat instead of letting it just sit here and rot. There's a lot of very interesting stories told by uh, the railroad, which cut straight through a lot of their habitat, of course, the huge plains, and how the bison would get pissed off at the um, you know the bullets coming out of the railroad, and a herd would sometimes charge the railroad and upend it. So it was almost like. A lot of the way people interpreted it was, was really a physical war of expansion and, and possession of land. 